for this week's Challenge Wednesday, we have Ophelia. And Ophelia was recently diagnosed with Whiplash Associated Disorder, WAD, after a severe motor vehicle accident. The patient has an inverted supinator sign, clumsiness in both hands, and difficulty performing wrist extension against resistance. Which of the following pathologies is the most likely present? So we have A, central cord syndrome. B is brachial plexus traction injury. C is a C6 nerve root compression. And D is a radial nerve lesion. All right, so you can see from this question already, it's going to be a little bit into that differential diagnosis, trying to figure out which of these neural pathologies it is. I've been getting a lot of questions from you all, you know, about this type of topic, saying that you've been having trouble trying to pick out what type of nerve pathology it, it is, right? Those types of questions kind of trip you up. And so I, I got this question here for you that I want to walk you through step by step. All right, let's knock it down. So we got Ophelia was recently diagnosed with whiplash associated disorder. I want to stop there for a moment. I like that name Ophelia, by the way, that's, that's nice. I like that. All right. So we got Ophelia whiplash associated disorder. This is definitely something you want to be aware of on the MPT. Obviously the name kind of, it, it, it kind of just tells you a bit about what it is, you know, whiplash associated disorder. Uh, is going to be a, really a series of impairments that a patient has after some type of traumatic event that causes a whiplash type of motion. All right. So we'll tend to see this win with a motor vehicle accident, um, but it doesn't have to be always. All right. It doesn't have to be a motor vehicle accident. It's really just any type of situation where the patient's neck is abruptly moved from one position to the ne to the next and just a rapid nature. OK, that can create that more whiplash type of motion. And so, again, there's a lot of cervical impairments, pain, just increased guarding of the cervical muscles, headaches. The patient can start having migraines or just cervicogenic headaches. There's a lot of stuff that comes along with whiplash associated disorder. And this is one of the things I would say I saw a lot of when I was working as a PT. All right, getting a lot of the motor vehicle accidents and then the whiplash and just that cervical pain that's just nasty. You know, they're coming into you like super guarded, upper traps are overactive. They're complaining to you about headaches all the time. And as soon as you kind of go in there to just move those muscles around and kind of loosen them up, sometimes that provokes the situation. Well, that's all very consistent with whiplash associated disorder, not to mention vertigo. All right, vertigo can come along with this as well. So I just want to give you a bit of an understanding of about what we're dealing with right now for future reference. Okay. So with this patient, Ophelia, she has whiplash associated disorder after a severe motor vehicle accident. That makes sense to me. All right. Let's go ahead and move down the line. It says the patient has an inverted supinator sign, clumsiness in both hands. All right, so I'm going to highlight that. If you hear me pause and I'm just highlighting a little bit and difficulty performing wrist extension against resistance. I'm going to stop here for a second because what I want to do is I want to go back through each one of those and make sense of it so we can rule in and rule out answer choices. Make sense? All right. So it says the patient has an inverted supinator sign. If you don't know that, you need to for the MPTE. See. Now, here's the deal. With an inverted supinator sign, when you strike that reflex, what tends to happen is that you have a patient who starts to do a lot of finger flexion. Y'all hear me, right? They start to do finger flexion, not so much the elbow flexion, but finger flexion. All right. That's known as an inverted supinator sign. It is not normal. And it's something that we tend to see in a patient with an upper motor neuron lesion. Let me put it down. So go ahead and put that down in your nose. Upper motor neuron lesion. You tend to see this thing called an inverted supinator sign. Cool. So I'll put that in my little toolbox for now. We'll come back and look at that a little bit later, but that's something that we need to know. Next, it says clumsiness in both hands. And so what am I thinking there? Okay, possibly by for the first thing I see is both hands. So I know it's bilateral something. So that's important. But also on top of that, 
you know, what else am I seeing? Well, clumsiness in both hands, that would be weakness bilaterally in the hands. So I'm keeping that in mind. All right. Do you know the myotome that's primarily responsible for, for grip strength? I mean, the actual flexors of the hand. Who's primarily doing that? Who's responsible for that? You should be saying, well, that, that, that C8, baby, that C8 deals a lot with the finger flexors. And so I'm just, I'm just keeping some things in the back of my mind right now. I'm just keeping some things. Okay. Let me go down to the next piece. It says, and difficulty performing wrist extension against resistance. So let me stop there. Perf difficulty performing wrist extension against resistance. What is that telling me? The patient has weak wrist extensors. Well, uh, what do I know about wrist extension and possibly the nerves that are involved with that? Well, we know that wrist extension is C6 myotome primarily. All right. I also know that the radial nerve is the one who's responsible for supplying a lot of the wrist extensors. And so I, you know, those are just some things, some ideas that are going, you know, through my mind right now. I don't know what's going through your mind. You'll have to let me know. Now let's move down to the last piece of this. It says, which of the following pathologies is the most likely present? Pretty straightforward stem here. For those of you on the podcast, let me go through the answer choices. It says, A, central cord syndrome. B, brachial plexus traction injury. C, C6, nerve root compression. And D is radial nerve lesion. All right, so let's go ahead and break these down real quick. A says central cord syndrome. If you don't know what that is, we need to know. All right, we're talking about the spinal cord when we say central cord syndrome. And if you look at a transection of the spinal cord, like if you were looking from the head down into the spinal cord and we kind of cut it, you know, sliced it, did a transection, well, central cord syndrome is going to be damaged to the inner part of that spinal cord. Now, here's the deal. Let me ask you a question. You, you please, please participate on this one. Is a spinal cord injury, an injury to the actual spinal cord, is that upper motor neuron or is it lower motor neuron? What would you say? Come on, hit me with it. You should be saying it's upper motor neuron. And I like central cord syndrome here because it's upper motor neuron. And I know an inverted supinator sign is found with an upper motor neuron problem. I also know that central cord syndrome could potentially create inverted supinator sign. So I, I, I really like it. I think it's good. Clumsiness in both hands. Do I see that in a patient with central cord syndrome? Yes, I do. Why? Because central cord syndrome, it affects the upper extremities more than the lower extremities. And a lot of times your patient will, will present with a lot of hand weakness. That makes sense. I like it. Now, the last part of the question was saying, and difficulty performing wrist extension against resistance, do I expect that with central cord syndrome? What do you think? Well, I told you central cord syndrome has a lot to do with weakness in the upper extremities. It wouldn't surprise me if this patient did have weakness and wrist extension here. Now, specifically wrist extension? I don't, I'm not going to say specifically that. I mean, I, I guess it would depend more on the level of where the central cord syndrome is, like the actual lesion. It doesn't tell me anything about that, but we could definitely have difficulty performing wrist extension. Bottom line, I'm telling you, I like central cord syndrome. The other reason though, why I like it is because the question says whiplash associated disorder and central cord syndrome is one of the conditions that can definitely happen after some type of like cervical, uh, cervical, you know, traumatic accident, you know, where the patient's head is flipped back into extension or hyperextension very rapidly. That is common with central cord syndrome. I like it. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a nice little check next to that one, but it doesn't mean it's the right answer. Let me move down the line. B says brachial plexus traction injury. Hmm. Okay. So what do you think of when you hear brachial plexus traction injury? The first thing that comes to my mind from like an MPT perspective is uh, Herb's palsy. That, I mean, that's just the first thing I think of. You may be thinking of maybe the stinger. Maybe you're thinking of the stinger, the football player that's, that, that, that their shoulder gets separated from their head. You know, the head goes one way, the shoulder goes the other way, and then they get this brachial plexus traction injury. I think of that too. All right. The one thing I know about brachial plexus traction injuries, though, is that 
is that they're unilateral problems. Think about it. If I have a brachial plexus traction injury on the right, it's going to create right-sided problems. It's not going to create bilateral problems. All right. So do we have bilateral problems with Ophelia or is it unilateral problems? Is bilateral. Yeah. So here's the deal. Brachial plexus traction injury doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense here. Also, brachial plexus traction injury, is that a, a um, upper motor neuron problem or a lower motor neuron problem? You should be saying that is peripheral nerves, baby. And so I wouldn't expect to have an inverted supinator sign with this lower motor neuron related condition. I'm putting a big fat X next to it. I don't like it. Let me move on to the next one. C says C6 nerve root compression. Nerve root compression. What am I thinking of? More of like a radiculopathy, right? Pressing down on the C6 nerve root. Ah, so here's the problem with that. Is that bilateral or is that unilateral? Because I would say in most cases, a radiculopathy is more of a, a unilateral type problem that will not produce upper motor neuron problems. And so although you may see definitely the uh, difficulty performing wrist extension, I agree with you. Yeah, you would see that. But you definitely wouldn't see inverted supinator sign with a C6 nerve root compression. You just wouldn't. And you wouldn't see clumsiness in both hands either. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a big fat X next to that one. I don't like it. Let's look at D, radial nerve lesion. And I think for a lot of you, you're already catching on to this whole idea of upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron. Listen, the radial nerve, is it upper motor neuron or is it lower? You should be saying lower, 100%. Radial nerve lesion is a, well, the radial nerve is a peripheral nerve. Peripheral nerves are lower motor neuron. And so I do not expect inverted supinator sign with this. Um, can you get clumsiness in both hands? I would say weakness in the grip strength, but not necessarily clumsiness. All right. And, and do you expect to get difficulty with performing wrist extension against resistance? Yeah. All right. I expect that. But really, that's the only one out of all the signs and symptoms I just gave you. That is like really the only one that actually fits the radial nerve lesion, to be honest. And so for that, I'm going to go ahead and put a fat X next to that one, leaving me with my final answer of mm, central cord syndrome. Let's get it, baby. If you got that question correct, congratulations. Not an easy one. That was for all my listeners out there that wanted to have your, your neuro-based question uh, that looked at differentially diagnosing these types of uh, uh, conditions here. So if you got that one correct, congratulations. Listen, this is a question where I want you to dive into it a little bit. Possibly listen to this again. Get an understanding for what these terms mean and how they will present. Super important for you to be able to dominate the April 2020 exam. I'm just letting you know.